I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, we're going to move into executive session. Chair will entertain a motion to move into executive session for reason three, which is contract negotiations. So moved. Sorry, second. Uh, it requires a formal vote. Mr. Oakley? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye, and we will reconvene to our regular meeting. Thank you. That's quick. Call the meeting back to order, and I would ask anyone who's able to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hello, everybody. Hello, Mr. Young. Uh, next, uh, up next piece on our agenda is public comment. Does anyone wish to speak on anything not on tonight's agenda? Seeing not, no one, I will move on. Discussion items. Mr. McCarthy. Congratulations to the girls' soccer and volleyball teams for clinching tournament berths. Good luck to the field hockey uh, team on their senior night tomorrow at 4 as they try and clinch a tournament berth with a win over Sturgis East. And then boys soccer also has their senior night game uh, tomorrow at Battis Field at 6.30 against West Bridgewater. The unified basketball team is off to a hot start, improving to 3-0 with a win over Seekonk today. Thank you to all of the fans, cheerleaders, concert choir, and band members for making the first home game against Dighton Rehoboth a special one. Uh, last week was homecoming week. Congratulations to Bridget Lynch and Logan Dufilly for winning homecoming queen and king. And uh, also congratulations to the class of 2019 for winning the float building competition. The class of 2023 came up for a visit last Wednesday and got tours of the building from student leaders uh, as well as watched the Choice is Yours video. The decision as to where one goes to high school is a big one and we hope they choose MHS. The annual charity dinner last week raised over $1,000 to benefit the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Thank you to the entire community for supporting. And Student Council's annual Halloween Fun Fest is next uh, Monday, October 29th from 6 to 8 in the MHS cafeteria. Kids are welcome to play games, dance, and make crafts in their costumes for some candy. Thank you. I wanted to give a little feedback, if I could, regarding, regarding the... Uh, that the students coming up from the middle school and between the tour guides and everything that went on there, my daughter was thought it was the most awesome thing. and She's excited actually to go the next year. She's ready to go. I said, it, it's October. Um, but it, I would give feedback if it was otherwise, but I got to tell you, she was so excited. And I, that's a testament to what goes on, what you, what you guys do, what you guys do, all the pieces that are there. So uh, I, was, I was so happy to hear. Because I was worried that she was going to be a little more apprehensive, but she was. At the, even the tour guys were really good, so awesome. Any other questions for Owen? I, I know Owen has to take off after this because he's off to the girls' soccer game. Um, but I do want to make a comment, and that is um, for those of you who don't know, 
Um, Mr. McCarthy does quite a bit uh, at Middleborough High School, and I think he should be recognized over and over again. Aside from sitting here with us and all the other things we've all seen him do, He's added this year because it's a senior year, and I know he's been part of decorating a variety of events, including homecoming. Uh, but more importantly, he also jumped to be a participant and help with the unified basketball team. And so I know we're gonna talk about that a little later, Owen, but I really wanna thank you um, because it's, it's people like you who really make uh, you know, Middleborough a better place, not just Middleborough High School, but Middleborough as a town and a community um, and you should really be proud of yourself um, for going above and beyond over and over and over again. And uh, Brian and I have both sat on this committee with you for three years. Um, and again and again, you have always stepped up for the school system and for this community. And I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Owen. And enjoy the uh, girls' game. Thank you. Um, Stay warm. Next item on our agenda is uh, reports from school committee members. Does any uh, school committee members have anything they wish to talk about? Um, the only thing I wish to just mention uh, again to the community since we won't see them, um, November 6th is election day. Uh, please get out. Uh, we will be closed uh, for a school. The, there will still be professional development for the teachers, but please get out and vote. Uh, no matter what you believe, it's important to get out and vote, and so I want to mention that to people. I think early voting ends tomorrow. Yes, and also I should also mention that there will be a Veterans Day parade because I don't think we'll be in session until after the Veterans Day parade. And, you know, for people who gave so much, it's the least we can do to make sure we either head out to town, downtown to watch the parade or when weather's been bad, it's always been moved into the town hall rotunda um, and so please stop by. Uh, a lot of kids from the schools do a great job as being part of the bands uh, to um, be a part of it. But uh, I think, uh, you know, I wanted to bring up those two things. And Mr. Chair, our, our middle school and high school bands participate in that parade. And we also have several students who are involved in other community organizations, such as the scouting, um, who do participate in the parade. So it's a great opportunity. Uh, Rain or shine, really, the high school band does play inside the auditorium if it is pouring rain and they cancel the parade. Unfortunately, the last couple of years, we've had a couple of cancellations, uh, so hopefully they'll have the parade outside. It's always a little bit better when they have the parade uh, and the Memorial Day assembly. Mr. O. I just want to say um, early voting will be on Saturday also from 11 to 1, um, Town Hall Annex building. same building as that's true but also <laughs> I'm voting at on that day so, so excellent it's, it's fresh in my mind any uh, other things then I will move on uh, mr. Catino you are up next and thank you I have a tendency to vote on voting day because my precinct votes at the high school, so it's real easy for me. Although I, have, I walk out the front door around and go in through the gym, and then when I, I don't cut through, because you're not supposed to do that, I don't want, it, I don't want the police to, to get mad at me. So. Um, so I have something that I've handed out to all of you, um, and I wanna just kinda read through some of my bulleted uh, statements um, and talk about a resolution that I'd like you to consider. Um, so the Middleborough Education Association is asking you, the school committee of the town of Middleborough, to support a resolution urging the legislature to approve a new foundation budget formula that will increase public funding, uh, funding for public schools across Massachusetts. The resolution reads as follows. Whereas free public schools available to all students without exception are foundation are foundational to our democracy and required by the state constitution. And whereas all of our students, no matter where they live, deserve high quality public schools that teach the whole child and provide them with a rich school experience that addresses their academic, social, and emotional needs. Whereas the state's foundational, foundation budget formula 
which determines state aid to each district has been woefully out of date for years, thereby underfunding our districts by more than a billion dollars a year for essential educational services. And whereas an updated foundation budget formula would bring the Middleborough Public Schools up to $628,250 in additional aid each year, allowing this district to move closer to providing all students with the education to which they are entitled as residents of the Commonwealth. And whereas the legislature failed to pass any foundation budget legislation in the last session, leaving districts, educators, and students without the funds necessary to support the schools our students deserve in every district in the state, Therefore, the School Committee of the Town of Middleborough urges the legislature to approve and fully fund a new foundation budget formula by May 1st, 2019. Um, that would be the resolution. Um, <clears throat> the Foundation Budget Review Committee actually recommended changes that would increase the Chapter 70 funding of the Town of Middleborough uh, by about, well, I had rounded it to 625,000, but the exact figure which was provided to the MTA was $628,250. And that funding would be by 2023. Um, and I applaud the school committee uh, and the town for what they've done in regards to maximizing the use of the available funds that are, that are spent towards the education of the students in the town. But we all know that there are always items that get cut during the budget process. Having enough funds available to meet the needs of the students of the town is always a struggle. While the increase is only a fraction of the current total budget, I'm confident that the school committee would put the extra funds to very good use. We all want the students to have the best possible education that we can provide, and the district has made great strides. All problems cannot be solved through the budget process. The average expenditure, but the average expenditure per student of the top school districts in the state, and I averaged the top 20 school districts based on their assessment formulas, we fall about $2,500 below, below the average consistent for, for, what they, for what they spend on schools. Now, the $628,000 is not gonna be the, everything that we would ever want, but at least it would start to help. And what we were asking is for you to consider the resolution that I have presented to you or a similar alternate resolution that you craft yourselves within a time frame that's in accordance with your normal procedures for actually having resolutions voted on. And that's this is my, what I have. No, Does anybody have any questions? Frank, so you, know, you sent that to me today. So I, I did, did forward everything to the <clears throat> school committee earlier in the day. So thank you very much. Um, I figured I'd give you some printed out version. No, 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 that's perfect. Um, because what we can do is we will put it on our next agenda to take a vote on. Now, the thing I just wanted to tell you was um, this committee has supported the, uh, the Foundation Budget Review Commission in the past. Um, that was one of the resolutions at the Massachusetts uh, School Committee Association last year. Mm -hmm. And um, I, as the delegate, voted to support that and informed the, um, the school committee afterwards. I sort of have um, right to make decisions in the moment uh, that the school committee has given me, but that was one. Uh, and the superintendent and I had gone to a Mass Association of School Committees and Mass Association of Superintendent workshop on the foundation budget review. And I know that both of us had uh, obviously liked what they had done. Um, I had also been a part of uh, meeting with the foundation review budget previously when they were doing their review um, and providing input. Um, so I think this is fantastic, Frank, and I think this will, uh, I don't have any issue with this, and I will bring this to the committee at the next uh, meeting. And Mr. Chair? Yeah. Through you. The Mass School Administrators Association, the Massachusetts Association of School Business Officials, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, along with the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, have all supported the foundation budget and, and this initiative to uh, right the ship with regard to uh, a budget. I'll forward you a copy of this February 5th, 2015 letter that was sent out to um, the Honorable Sonia Chang Diaz, who chaired that committee, which we went in there and we pretty much said the exact same thing we're saying here. <coughs> but, but I'll forward it so you have a copy of that. I don't know if you had a copy of it, but it pretty much uh, talks about, uh, I think the best one was reformulating, because they were talking about either reformulating or adding more. Well, reformulating the money is, uh, is divided amongst how money is divided amongst school districts is tantamount to rearranging the deck furniture on the Titanic, 
we need to permanently repair the hole before the ship sinks. Uh, the real question is how do we fix the hole in a sinking ship, as we referred to this whole problem. And the two possible answers are increased funding or decrease expenses through reduction of mandates and regulation. I mean, you gotta do one or the other. To free up more money, either stop 50 tests that are going on and maybe make it, pare it down to the ones you really need or uh, give us the additional funding. So um, I'll forward this off to you as well so you have that, as well as I'll send it out to all of us yeah. so we have it. I, I, do, I do recognize that the school committee in the past has supported the changes in the foundational budget, and I remember very, uh, very well uh, Mr. Giovannoni's um, arguments and support of changing or at least supporting reviewing the foundational budget in the past and pushing forward with this sort of stuff. Um, your support of that has, is, is well recognized, and had I, you know, um, and, and that, you know, kind of contributed to, you know, when I received this to say, hey, you know, let's, let's get, now there's been about, you know, 10 or 15 school districts already that have already passed these resolutions. And as you say, it's something that's being recommended across the board from all of your organizations plus my organization. It's definitely something that I think is just going to help um, overall the state. I mean, we're looking, I'm looking at, at ads for, for uh, Charlie Baker on, on, on television bragging about the billion dollars that that we have in surplus well let's fund some education um, this is a, a a very good time because no matter what um, what party you belong to or views you have um, there are going to be a hundred brand new legislators in the Massachusetts state legislation legislate uh, yeah. The legislative this year um, and if you think about it from this perspective there will be at least two new legislators from Middleborough alone um, and so I, I think it's incumbent upon you know it's sort of there's a large percentage moving out um, January is when bills can be filed um, and they start anew and it sort of makes sense to make sure that uh, people understand what our position is absolutely because I actually had the op op opportunity last week, uh, actually a week and a half ago, to uh, ask the governor specifically about the transportation bills that are going to DCF. So um, as he put it, there was money in the budget that they had put in yet didn't get approved by the legislature. I said, why don't you just rescind the letter from January of 2018 and let us go billing the other school district? For what? I said, there's a lot of things you could do. I go, let's just keep an eye on these little things because as we as a district have to make the decision of whether we continue to provide school security officers or pay the transportation bills that are being mandated to us, which we didn't willingly accept under McKinney-Vento when that vote was taken because I made the motion. Um, we are not getting funding for an unfunded mandate. Um, and at some point, I hope we'll, we'll get some kind of resolution from the state auditor on that. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. I'm just I think it's fortunate that Frank mentioned the town of Middleborough because the town of Middleborough has gone beyond the net school spending required um, each year for the school system. So they spend more. The town of Middleborough has supported a brand new high school. So we're happy with the town of Middleborough. We're not, this is not a disagreement with the town of Middleborough. This is a, this is a state funding formula that, that is controlled by the state legislature. Um, and like I said, uh, Middleborough has, has certainly done its share. The town has done its share to support education. Yeah, there's no doubt that the town does quite a lot to support education. I mean, without the support of the town, we wouldn't have a one-to-one -one initiative up at the high school, one-to-one -one initiative at the middle school. Uh, you know, and those are, you know, moving our students forward. Um, but additional funding from the state to help close some of these other gaps that keep popping up, that would be helpful. Any other questions? Mr. Coutinho, uh, thank you. This, this looks good. It seems like something I would support um, when I get the chance to vote on it. I just wondered, is this, um, when we vote on this, is this something to be used to urge our legislators to, to, to create a, a resolution and well, it's to, it's to urge the legislature to pass what they didn't last year. The foundation budget changes came up, and it was one of the one of the things that they let die, so to speak. They didn't address it. They they could have, um, but they chose not to at that point in time. So it's urging them to bring that back up again and pass the recommendations of the foundation budget uh, review commission. So, 
to this when we get, we get to it that might say something out of since this isn't an election year you can do this <laughs> right, sorry, sorry. <laughs> any other questions mr. Catino? Very not. thank you mr. Catino and right. we'll definitely have this on the agenda for next meeting thank you thank you next up is the superintendent's report Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, members of the audience. Uh, my report tonight focuses on a number of, of activities going on in the school system. I would invite uh, Mr. Paul Brannigan and, and Mr. Ryan Sylvia up to the microphones uh, to talk about items one and two, which is our homecoming week celebration, really, at, at Middleborough High School and the town, at some of the events, so they can highlight some of the events and some of the things that went on. We also have the Unified Sports Update, just to give you an idea. Uh, a number of us had a chance to attend that game and participate in a standing ovation for that group of students. So, um, gentlemen, you have the floor if you'd like to just sort of discuss some of the activities of homecoming and uh, the unified sports. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Um, first and foremost, we had a really an exciting week at the high school last week with our homecoming week. And um, when there was a scenario that was presented to us in regards to um, having to have our football game on a Friday night. One, at first it was, that was a conflict because we've always done it on a Saturday and it needs to be a Saturday because that's the tradition of our homecoming. But then it really, we realized that it really became an opportunity for us to, um, to really rethink how we do homecoming and creating new traditions, but also embracing the things we've always done. So um, working collaboratively with Ryan um, and actually with our, the student group that we collaborated to kind of bring together our unified student group that we have, our Club Us. Um, it brings all of our sports teams, captains and activity presidents and um, we have a team of about maybe 60 kids or so um, that meet with us periodically to really talk about how to unify our students even more. Um, and they really became a charge of really what homecoming could be beyond just the student council planning it, which is really quite exciting. Um, it really became an approach to make sure that every one of our sports teams was part of that week besides the random big game in the middle of a week if it happened to fit. Um, and really creating some new opportunities. Um, between our theme days, um, our talent show, we incorporated the concert choir into the week, um, which was nice because now you're giving activity every night of the week for students, but also you're allowing other groups to have a part of that big week of the, of the, of the school. Um, the talent show, we um, had our unified sports basketball game, which I'll have Ryan speak to because what a day that was. Um, our homecoming dinner was held on Thursday night and the students raised over $1,000 for um, the Dana-Farmer Cancer Institute. Um, and having all of our sports teams and families and community members come to that dinner, um, the cafeteria was packed, which was wonderful. Um, Friday was our parade down to Battis Field, which actually we thought was going to be really early, which ended up being perfect timing to then bridge all of the senior events of celebrating our cheerleaders and our football team, um, our band and majorettes in the pregame and during this game ceremony of, of the football game Friday night. And then, of course, we had the dance on Saturday, but really a new tradition that got started, which was really quite exciting, was all the Saturday games, which I'll have Ryan speak to, but also the community feel of that morning um, between our soccer teams and field hockey playing, but then also the food trucks that we brought in and the um, vendors that came in to be a part of that day. Um, it was a nice crowd for a really first time event to do at the high school. And really the vision of it is, is that with the new high school coming, does a, the, that area of the property between the high school and the stadium um, really could lend itself to really have some really great community events, especially around homecoming, because we are self-contained. And um, it gave a nice little test run of what could be. So um, we had well over 600 students at the dance. So when you think of our school population, that's almost every kid was at that dance. And um, it was really a wonderful, wonderful week. So a thank you to the students who were involved, but really a thank you to Ryan and his collaboration to really bring um, all of our athletics together to work collaboratively with the activity side of the building um, to really ensure that it was a, a week for all. So I'll have Ryan talk a little bit about the kind of new other nuances of that. Sure. Um, I think one of the one of the things I always try to instill in our teams is one of the signs of a successful athletic program is the extent that we support each other. And that gave us an opportunity. Having those Saturday games gave us an opportunity for, it's not all about just everyone going and watching the football game on Friday night. It's about the football players and the cheerleaders coming back and watching some soccer and watching some field hockey. And uh, we made an effort to have a few other games like volleyball and cross country. We're not able to uh, 
compete on those days. They competed earlier in the week and at other times, but I think it just gives us a chance in the future to kind of look at it and do even more planning and, and really uh, you know, extend it a little bit more and get even more student athletes involved on that one, that homecoming day. So it was actually fun to, to work with, uh, it was really fun to work with Paul um, and that club us and let them kind of come up with the ideas of bringing the food trucks in. And uh, I want to definitely thank uh, Sean Siciliano for helping out with, um, you know, we're setting up speakers and we got uh, the concert choir out there singing the national anthem on a Saturday morning. And um, Mr. Breen was the announcer, just like he was for the football game. So it was just a good feel uh, all around. Um, a big highlight of the week was our team unified. Uh, game. Yeah, so if, uh, so the unified uh, basketball game was the Thursday uh, before the Friday night football game. And um, th through the planning process, we, we got the, uh, the cheerleaders on board to cheer at the event. We got the concert choir again. I think the concert choir sang Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday morning uh, national anthem. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, and we had, uh, because we had some other games going on on that Thursday, we weren't able to get the band there, but we're hoping for our next home game, we'll have the band at the Unified game as well. Um, and it was, it was a, uh, the theme from, coming from Club Us and Student Council was a pink out for October uh, for breast cancer awareness. So there was, you know, a lot of pink in the gym and um, it was packed and it was just a, it was just a good feeling all around. Um, and as far as an update, kind of just to go further, I think that the update for Unified Sports was the, was the agenda item. And really, the only update is just being thankful uh, that we have the opportunity and that we have the support of the school committee and the school district to offer this type of program for uh, the student athletes that are, that are participating in it. We have 13 uh, students on the team. Uh, there's a maximum of 15. Uh, four of those students are partners. Uh, uh, what we call partners, so they're uh, student athletes who are assisting with um, the, the athletes that are on the team. And uh, Owen, like, uh, Owen was here, he's one of those partners. We have uh, three others, um, and uh, they're, they're doing a great job, and they, they really lead the way. Uh, we also, the coaches, uh, Ash Barron as an assistant coach, Andy Dizel as an assistant coach, and then um, Jason Carroll is the head coach, and they've all been doing a great job. They practice two days a week, uh, just for an hour after school, uh, as we discussed kind of earlier when we proposed this team, uh, 2.15 to 3.15, and they have uh, five games total, three away, and, uh, and two home games. And so they, have, they had their second away game today at Seekonk, and uh, we have our next home game, uh, mark your calendars, is, is going to be uh, – Wednesday, November 7th, and that's a four o'clock game against Dartmouth High School. Um, and we're hoping to make it another big event and we want as much support as we can get uh, from the students in the school and, and anybody really who, who wants to come. Um, it's, one of those, it's one of those events where if, once you get there and you see the, the smiles on the kids' faces and how excited they are to be participating in, in a sport uh, and getting the support from their classmates, uh, it just puts a smile on your face, it's a great feeling. Well, the next season that uh, Paul and I have talked about this uh, uh, is Special Olympics offers unified track and field. Uh, there's a little bit of a challenge with that in the, our current situation uh, with us losing the track uh, this, this spring. Um, but I have kind of explored some options with some, some neighboring schools and seeing if that's a possibility of maybe combining a couple days a week and, and seeing if that's an option. Uh, we do have bocce already, uh, Mr. Brannigan got going. Uh, before before I was here, but um, definitely I think, and and the other the other side too of expanding this program is what what I learned is some school districts have uh, they allow you to have multiple teams. So if the limit that you can have on this team is 15 students combined with partners and athletes, um, but you can have multiple teams and they can all practice together. And you might have a back to back game on the days days you have games where you have an A team and a B team. So. Um, <coughs> There's no limit in terms of, you know, how many, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't think we're going to have more than, you know, 30, 40, 50 kids on a basketball team, but as many as we can fit on the bus and we'll send them to an away game and, and, and let them play. Other uh, I just want to say a couple things. One, uh, I want to thank the superintendent, too, because, you know, the superintendent has his duty, but he's also at the 
homecoming game on Friday night, and he was there the entire time for Saturday uh, selling. So I appreciate that. Um, well, well, I need to clarify. My daughter was selling. Yeah, no, I get it. I assisted. You were overseeing, <laughs> sort of. But, uh, but that homecoming Saturday was fantastic. And the food trucks and just um, parent after parent uh, talking to me, telling me how wonderful it was, how much they enjoyed it. And even from the other team. Uh, they didn't enjoy the beating we gave them in soccer, but <laughs> they, uh, they, um, they enjoyed being there and thought it was fun and, and talked about, like, why can't we do this at our school? Um, so I thought that was great. Uh, the other thing I can say about the Unified game was um, that was just fantastic. Um, I've been to quite a few games. I know occasionally I get in trouble with referees, but I've never been to a game where um, no matter what side you were on, the entire stands were rooting every kid every time, and it was just unbelievable. And it just um, it cracked me up because uh, Ryan read sort of the rules that we always read at the beginning of every game, which goes over that we're, you know, we're here, uh, you, know, you can't uh, harass refs and everything like that, uh, sportsmanship. And then it was, it was just a fantastic feeling about how, how each of those kids were treated and how excited they were, you know, that everyone was just going nuts for them. It was fantastic. And so I just want to thank you both. I want to thank you, for Brian, for bringing the idea to us and allowing us to do that because, in my mind, quite frankly, with the exception of working on the high school, uh, that unified basketball team is one of the things I'm most proud of that we as a committee decided to do because I think that's just fantastic. I mean, there's a, there are a lot of people, so, you know, I, Mr. Brannigan and I work together to get it going, and, and there's a lot of people volunteering their time to make sure it happens, so it's, it's just a, a great thing all around. I'll be at the school community conference, so um, I, I would recommend to everybody to go out and just sit in the gym and, be, and watch it because it's fantastic. It was, it was great. Uh, I do have some issues with Mr. Dizel's coaching, but aside from that, <laughs> where else? I did tell him that already, so I feel good about that. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank Thanks. you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Next to my agenda, Mr. Chair, is, is a note uh, with regard to the Summer Smart Reading Challenge, and we have some grant winners. Uh, received a letter from Deb Walgreen, who's the librarian here at the Nichols Middle School. Um, it's, I just want to tell you a little bit about Deb. She volunteered to do this program and, and put it in place. Deb's maiden name is Nichols, and she's one of the, the Tiger Nichols, who the school is named after. She's one of Tiger Nichols' children, who's also a librarian here, so a little particular flair to that. And she wrote me a note in October saying, Brian, dear Brian, I just want to share some positive news about our school and about a particular student at Nichols Middle School, Anna Dufresne. This past summer, some of our students took part in the Summer Reading Challenge by using an online program called Readocity, uh, that I shared with them in May. Approximately 200 of Nichols students created a profile and some of them logged in over the summer. As a result, the total of 64,000 minutes of reading took place by the students who participated, making them the winners of the contest in their category. Anna, a current seventh grader, won the challenge in the individual category, reading 1,825 minutes. Of the 17 schools in Massachusetts who participated in the contest, we came out on top and will receive a $1,000 grant. I have attached a copy of the Herald article, which ran in this, this past Sunday's Boston Herald. We are very excited and proud of the efforts by our students who participated. Also a letter from Julie DeFrancesco, who is the head of the Mass Literacy Foundation, and it's addressed to Ms. Walgreen. Dear Ms. Walgreen, congratulations to the students at John T. Nichols Junior Middle School for winning the 2018 Summer Smart Reading Challenge. Your school logged more reading minutes on average per student than any other school in the state. We are thrilled that your students were able to achieve this such success. In close, please find your grant check for $1,000, which is to be used for the school library at John T. Nichols Junior Middle School. Sincerely, Julie DeFrancesco, Mass Literacy Director. So big congratulations to the students who participated at Nichols Middle School, Anna Dufresne, the student that won, and I would recommend that at a future school committee meeting, we have Anna join us, and we can congratulate her personally. Okay. 
Moving on, Mr. Chair, I would invite Ms. Donnie Jamison, who is the current assistant principal of Middleborough High School, one of the two assistant principals of, Middle, of the Middleborough High School. Uh, her role also in the community is to work with the what's called the Middleborough Matters Group. It is a grant-based group uh, which is tasked with drug and alcohol awareness and prevention, and uh, she is a member of the committee. Uh, Greg Thomas is a member of the committee. Our police chief and fire chief are members of the committee. The chief chairman of the school committee is the member. I am the member. But they are part of the working group, and they are the ones that do the yeoman's work with this grant. This grant is funded by pretty much uh, application, but to complete an application, we have to have data. And to complete that data, to gain that data, to gain an understanding of where we stand in the town, we need to survey our students. And that's why Donnie's here today to sort of explain a, a process by which we need to survey our students. So, Ms. Jameson, welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you for hearing this tonight. It's important work that this entire committee has done. Um, SAPSI is a Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition. That, who, that is who brought us the grant. Um, we're in our third year. So we've done a lot of work, and um, we work with Plymouth and Carver collectively. So that's who's in the grant. We did a survey in 2016, exactly this week, 2016, um, on alcohol use and knowledge and marijuana use and knowledge for the entire high school. It was a 20-minute survey. It was paper and pencil. But it was done out of UMass Amherst, their health and wellness, because we can't pay for a, we can't pay for a survey, because then it certainly it would be skewed. So UMass is paired with us so that they are giving us a survey through their statistical programming, and they do everything for us, which is extremely helpful. So we did that survey, um, and there, there are results for that, which um, I don't want to share right now, but we have them available for you if you would like them. And that has driven the work that the Middleborough Matters and Sagefam supporters, which is the the high school group has used to drive what they've done. They did a sticker shock campaign. They did um, some literature home to juniors and seniors about what the social host law means. So families are hosting parties and serving alcohol. So they've done, and many, many other things. They invited Maura Haley to come talk to them at the high school, and she came. I mean, there's a whole host of things that have happened. We'd like to do the survey again, and we'd like to do it very soon, because now we are pre- we were pre-legal -mar mar marijuana use, and now we are post. So we want to know what these kids are thinking about the same questions and what their thoughts are. And what it also asks what their family's thoughts are and what their friends' thoughts are. So it's pretty in-depth, um, even though it's only about 30 questions. It is a very in-depth survey asking them about uh, how old were they, if they ever used it, if they've never used it. How old were some of their friends? What do they know about family use? And this particular survey increased the questions by about five or six to ask what they know about medical marijuana and potential usage in their family or guardians or even friends. So it's going to take it to that next level. And it will be the first survey in the state to have that information. So we would like to do that. Carver did it today. I don't know the date of the Plymouth um, when they're doing it, but if possible, um, the high school could facilitate this as early as next week. This data then comes to the committee. It comes right to the committee. And then next steps. Next steps. Um, so the SAPSI so works directly with High Point, which works directly with the health department of the state. So it would go to the state. Um, it would be the only data they have right now covering this. Um, so it would drive our next steps as a committee for Middleborough Matters on what um, the grant starts off with underage drinking and that knowledge and then goes to marijuana use and then opiate use. So it would bring potential more pr programming. Um, we have brought speakers to the high school. We're planning to bring more. Um, we have hidden in plain sight. I don't know if you walked by it, but it's down here tonight. And um, the funding that the kids have raised helped pay to purchase that so we own it. So Middleborough, Plymouth, and Carver own that so we can take it anywhere, anytime. And it's been very well received by parents and guardians. It's exceptionally powerful. Um, so those are the things that we can do and we can raise more funding and we can include more community members. And we're having a community forum the first week in November at the YMCA also to share resources. It's about sharing resources and knowledge. 
100% anonymous too, right? So, you, right. And that's why it's interesting you asked that question. Um, they tried to do this in another district um, online, which we know, right, kids are great on that. A lot of kids refused to do it because of the IP address. They were afraid it could be traced to them which I totally respect. So UMass Amherst um, was wonderful in understanding that. And so it is a paper and pencil. Um, and Marielle Paul, who's actually here tonight, is the director. She will come and secure the documents, deliver them to the high school, and then they will, be, they will leave the school that day. I like, I like the question. In, they need to be asked. They need to be asked. You're going to start, are you going to go all the way down to just the high school, or are you going to go down to broach the middle this school. particular survey to match the 2016 would be just the high school. Not to say UMass may not approach us at another time because we do recognize that middle school kids and families need this information. And then you'll get into opioids and maybe then a subsequent questionnaire? I don't know the answer to that. Um, the grant the grant is driven by um, underage drinking and marijuana use, but certainly we, can ha we have tons of resources for opioid um, addiction or families who need help. And that's been a question since the very beginning about opioids uh, when this program started, which was the understanding the grant is the grant, and we have to maintain the, what the grant asks us to do, but there has always been pieces about that. Donnie, the only thing I'd like to say is um, I would add that I think it's important to do the middle school um, primarily because I'd like to see how things change when they get to the high school, if their opinions of things change over the two years or whatever and, and that kind of thing. So I think that would be good. But um, do you want to vote on this, Donnie, for support? I'd be comfortable with that. I think and then when we, when we tell parents it's coming, we could, we, that could be part of our correspondence. Um, I was just curious, um, I walked by the display out there, what is that? So hidden in plain sight is, is an average teenager or preteen bedroom. So when you walk in, it's only for adults. Kids are not welcome to go in. Um, and Marielle would show you where hidden in plain sight are the things that you might need to see that could relate to drug or alcohol use slash abuse. So there's a, a water bottle in there and unfortunately some of these items you would see in there are are bought on the internet and online. There's a water bottle that the bottom screws off and things are hidden in there. Um, there are slide-ins into your shoes where things can be hidden under what would look like a gel insole and there's a pocket where something could be hidden. Um, there's belts that have pockets where capsules could be placed. Um, so sometimes um, recommendations are given to families that you need to go home and really examine your, your child's room. Although it's their space, it's still in your home. And we have to have those honest conversations and parents need the tools to know what they're looking for. And it's, it's a difficult conversation, but it really helps a lot of parents go home and start that conversation to happen, so. It's not even the hidden pieces, you know, there's kids who dump out mouthwash and replace mouthwash with alcohol. And so, you know, it, it, same green, they can keep it out in the open, as it says, hide in plain sight, which is allows people just to, you know, it's just about what people do and how people do things and to be more observant of what happens. And I remember an event sponsored, um, I think it was Middle Bar Matters sponsored it, when they talked about not just mm -hmm. finding it and you not need to have a plan. You don't just all of a sudden go and say, get out, get over here. You know, you can't do that. You can't yell at it. You need a plan. So. This is the first step, but you also need to plan at that moment before you do the confrontation part because it could go diverging horribly, so, which is one of the things you don't want to have happen. But a lot of There are a lot of state resources that are hard to locate if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, and we've also been working with the Council on Aging to help grandparents who are raising younger students um, in, in giving them supports and knowledge. So that's the next community forum following the one in November is time and time again there's been programs and presentations for adults uh, and you know to have this conversation this is just not about conversations only with kids um, this has been about having conversations with adults too unfortunately at times it hasn't been as well attended as I think we'd all like to see but again you know we know the community has a drug and alcohol problem as all communities do and that's why we want people to be aware and to be able to have conversations with their children. Rich. One 
follow up. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely in support, and when we vote in a second, you'll see. But um, I, I would echo uh, Mr. Young's comments about if uh, I know the grant drives this, but if there's any way we could get middle school data, um, I'd, I'd be really interested in seeing that as well. L like you said, just so we have that chance at follow up. But yeah, thank you. Well, the new health teacher from the middle school has joined Middleborough Matters, so I'm hoping that um, we won't overwhelm him right away. But I'm hoping he can he can help us. Yeah, he can help us derive something to start, at least maybe even an introductory survey, um, and then we can carry it over for the number of years that would be appropriate. So, Thanks. you're welcome. So we'll make sure we notify the school board before we do something like that. So I do have a motion on the table and a second to support uh, Middleborough Matters in um, doing, doing the uh, uh, conversation with the kids in the form of a, a questionnaire. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very um, much, Donnie, and thank you for all the work you do on this committee. Donnie, I do want to say one thing, too, just in case people missed it. One of the great things uh, I thought that happened this year uh, that Donnie did was prior to prom season, um, there was a letter that was sent home to parents signed from essentially everybody in the community who had an important role, like the um, police chiefs, the principals, the town manager, just reminding parents about um, their responsibility with drinking and having host at hosting parties um, and I thought that was fantastic and I you know um, a lot of it, a lot of schools as we know have made it a requirement for parents to attend if their child um, uh, wants to go to the prom uh, but I thought this was a sort of a more open way and a way in which to let people know and they were mailed home to everybody they weren't they were mailed home and um, we weren't sure, Mr. Brannigan and Mr. Dizel and I, if we'd get any pushback or if we would offend any families. Um, and we didn't receive one phone call about anything, about any feelings um, negative in any way. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And again, for your participation and also your leadership on that committee because uh, there has been some turbulent times in its life, that, that committee, and, and we thank you for, for being a part of that, being a constant part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Next, Mr. Chair, I would invite Dr. Melanie Gates up to the table, and she has a couple of items to give you updates or provide updates for you. Uh, the first is English language learners, uh, and the second is a homeschool update. The first with English language learners. She's going to plug in. <coughs> and Dr. Gates, the floor is yours if you're so ready. Thank you, Superintendent Lynch and School Committee. Um, we'll start with talking about our English language learner program. Um, just to give you a little bit of flavor for what English language uh, learning program looks like here in Middleborough, we utilize a sheltered English immersion approach where essentially our um, students that are identified as English language learners are immersed in classrooms that utilize English as the predominant means um, for instruction, supported by English as a second language um, teachers to help students acquire um, English language. Um, <clears throat> our instructional model now consists of two full-time um, ESL teachers, where we have one dedicated to the elementary level and another to the secondary level. We, we have changed our model just a bit this year. Traditionally, it's been more of a pullout model where our students receive um, some of their English language instruction um, individually or in small groups, depending upon their um, English language learning level. Um, but we've been be, uh, exploring now um, push-in models, particularly at the high school um, where uh, we have the opportunity through the students that we're servicing um, to be able to go actually into their English class and provide direct support in the classroom um, for, for these students. Um, in addition to supporting students that are identified with uh, what the state would call limited English proficiency, we're also responsible for supporting students that have been recently redesignated as fluent in English. Um, where when students achieve a certain level score, which uh, off the top of my head, I think it's a 4.2 on the um, access exam, which is the English proficiency exam that our ELL students take. Once they reach a score of 4.2, and we feel that our local data supports this, we transition these students to being um, 
defined as uh, formally being limited English proficiency, and we are legally required to monitor those students um, for a couple years after um, they have received that designation to ensure that their English language proficiency continues to grow. So we're not only supporting the students that are identified um, with limited proficiency, we're still supporting our students that are, um, have been recently identified as uh, fluent in English. Our current program is serving 43 students, but that number is actually increasing. Um, we've had um, some new families join our community, and we're working with those new families um, to become uh, part of our community, both in uh, the community as a whole and within our schools. Um, this split is about a 70-30 split of 70% of those students being identified as limited English proficient and about 30% um, redesignated as fluent in English. Um, we serve many languages. Um, you can see um, here Arabic, Cape Verdean Creole, Creole, French, Gujarati, Greek, Haitian Creole, uh, Hmong, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, Urdu, and Vietnamese. Um, our languages have um, expanded over time. Um, more often than not, we were more um, supporting students that had Spanish as a first language. Um, Portuguese has now started to be on, uh, on the rise for us, um, but our, our population is growing and our language needs are growing with that. Um, just a little bit about some of our more immediate um, program goals. Um, we are continuing to enhance our English as a second language curriculum. Uh, our students, depending upon their level, um, their English language level, um, determines the, the type of instruction language instruction they need to receive. So it's important that we not only provide them with interventions to support them in their core academic classes, we have to provide instruction that allows them to acquire English. Um, that's not something that's only dependent upon our um, ESL teachers. It's, it's incumbent upon all of the teachers that support those students directly to help them acquire English. Um, and that is why teachers now are required to earn a sheltered English instruction endorsement for their license. Um, we're also working to foster deeper connections with our families. We find that the more we can connect with our English language learner families, the better we're able to support our students. And obviously that goes for all students. But we find that um, these families, um, if they're new to our community, need to be, feel welcomed into our community and supported. Um, we will be holding our first um, English language learner parent night uh, next month, and um, we're hoping to receive uh, many of our families and, and meet them in person and help support them and their child. We are transitioning to online access testing, so much like we transitioned to online testing for MCAS, we're also doing the same for access for students in grades um, three and higher and that could extend up through 12th grade, so it's not like MCAS where you reach 10th grade and you know, as long as you're deemed proficient, you don't have to test anymore. Um, students are tested annually um, to ensure that within six years they achieve English proficiency, um, which is the goal. And we are also um, beginning a more formal program evaluation in accordance with the expectation from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, that, the curriculum piece, um, really came out of the, the coordinated program review that had been conducted last year. Um, so I wanted to thank our two new um, ESL teachers, Mr. Christian Cardoza and Ms. Megan Riley. Um, Christian works at the elementary and Megan is at the secondary level. And I will tell you, they have formed quite a bond and are quite a strong team. I'm um, actually uh, meeting with them tomorrow um, we meet pretty regularly, supported by Mr. Car uh, John Cardoza, who, um, yes, he did retire, but he is still with us here supporting us in our transition as our needs to grow our ESL program are uh, quite evident. Um, happy. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> and, um, you know, maybe we're not sure we'll ever let him go because he's, he's just such a, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was a fake party. Yeah. He's, he, He's an extremely valuable asset for not only his abilities um, to support our English language learner students and their families, but he just has such a wealth of experience as an educator, and he's just such a good human being um, that I enjoy being able to collaborate with him, whether it's formally or informally. Um, 
I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about our English language learner program. I did not go into depth due to the fact that this is a smaller population and I'm trying to make sure that nothing that is discussed would identify any of our students in any way. But I'm happy to entertain any questions you may have. Hi, Dr. Gates. Um, I had two questions. Um, the first one might be a little silly, um, but how do students become known to the, the ESL program? Um, is, is that just um, a teacher notices that they're struggling and says you should go here, or how does that work? Um, when all students register, um, all students and their families are required to complete a home language survey, and that is really our first effort to be able to identify if there's any language needs for those students. But then also um, recommendations com can come in through teachers because sometimes our families do not wish to be identified in such a way. Um, they can actually opt out of English language um, support if they so choose. But when we receive our home language surveys, we review them and if a second language is identified um, for the student or within the home, we then conduct a screener. Um, so that really the first 30 days uh, of, of a school year are quite busy. Um, you think there's a lot of uh, assessment um, for in our school systems currently, but within the English language learner program, I feel like it's, it's uh, definitely amplified um, where all of the students have to be screened based upon the outcome of that screener will determine if um, they would enter into the English language learner program. And then as I stated, um, families do have the opportunity to opt out and um, that does happen. And we have to respect the, the, the wishes of our families. is how do we handle a situation in which a family has um, a language issue that we essentially don't have access to you know somebody speaks a language that there is no one in our district that um, speaks that language or can you know us you know what I mean um, well, uh, to be quite frank our ESL teachers do not speak any of these languages but they have um, intensive training to help them um, help our our students and our families acquire English. Um, when there is such a communication barrier, we have to really pull out all resources for translated documentation as well as having translators available as needed. And that's actually part of the home language survey where they respond that they want written communications in English or in their um, native language and if they require um, interpretive ser services, um, whether it's for an IEP meeting or parent-teacher conferences, and it's incumbent upon us to provide that for our families, and we do so. Other questions? Sorry, I had another one. Um, I, I think I understood in the beginning the pull-out and push-in was, was kind of talking about kids are either removed from class and, and doing other um, types of classes. But um, uh, if, a, if a family doesn't want necessarily to be just openly known as, as needing this type of help, um, what does that look like um, when the kids in classes um, is it something extra after school or is it during lunch or um, how does that work? If the family opts out, then they opt out of being for, um, part of a formal program. But obviously, regardless if they opt out, opt in, whatever it is, we do our best to support our students in any way. Um, so because they have opted out, they are not receiving direct support from our ESL teachers. It doesn't mean that they're not available for support. Um, what we have typically seen is the families that do opt out um, is because that they feel that they are acquiring English language on their own and they feel confident in their abilities with that. And again, we respect that decision of our families. We also place those children in, in rooms where we know we have teachers who have been trained and in a room also where that ES, ESL teacher will go into that room and help out those other students, but in doing so, will naturally be helping that, not direct, but, or directly, but it would be, we'll try to help that student in any indirect way we can, this so. All this is private, knows, like you said earlier, no one knows who they are, which is good, um, so. Yep. Much, like, much like our free lunch program and reduced lunch program. I would also say that, that, that Dr. Gates alluded to the fact that we did have some, uh, pushback from the state in our coordinated program review with regard to uh, a specific curriculum and with regard to an evaluation piece. Uh, both of those have been addressed through the new model 
uh, and they are working. But I would also note that we did get a, a, a gold star last year. Uh, we were noted as having a program that graduated every single one of our ESL students, 100% graduation rate in Middleborough Public Schools. So by the time they took the MCAS and they graduated, they, they all graduated. So. Uh, and we talked about the retirement party last year for Mr. Cardoza, which did occur. Uh, he had one of his students uh, do a speech during that ceremony, which was quite touching, uh, about how she was assisted by him and, um, and now was working in a bank as an interpreter for, for a community and uh, was highly regarded in that, in that financial institution. So kudos to that. So there are, we have been, you know, we were criticized for a couple things which we've addressed and we've also uh, had gold stars which hopefully we'll continue with. So. The homeschool update, which she's, is a, another area that she is the, the coordinator of. I've uh, had the good fortune of supporting our homeschool program for um, the last six years. Uh, prior to that, Mrs. Anita Rodriguez had provided leadership for this program. Um, we currently um, support 62 homeschooled students. Um, and again, um, due to confidentiality, that's the extent to which student data can be divulged. But I'd like to share with you what our procedures are for, um, for homeschool. These procedures do align with the home with um, the homeschool policy that you have all adopted. Um, our families are required to submit an annual notice of intent to pursue home education, and as per the the policy, um, it's expected that our our applicants describe their curriculum, the qualifications of the individual providing instruction, which is typically the parents, um, and what the means of evaluation are. Once I receive that written notice, um, and I you know, for flexibility purposes with our families, I do allow them to have digital communications with me. Um, um, I respond always officially in writing. Um, I have 10 days to respond to the receipt of a notice. Um, once that notice is received, I review it um, and make sure that the required information is there. And if there are any um, glaring issues that we communicate um, between myself and the families. Um, however, you know, Mass General Law really puts the um, onus of responsibility for home education on the shoulders of the parents, and they have the decisions to decide on what the curriculum is, what the means of instruction are, and the means of assessment. I really consider myself as um, a resource for families um, to help them make decisions to support what they feel is in the best interest of their child. So once I receive that notice and I review it, um, if there's any clarification that's needed, I work with the families to provide that. And then once um, I approve the plan, I respond in writing. I actually try to process both at the same time to save us a little postage um, because I do, they, I do require um, formal written notice to our families. Um, once the plan is approved and families are enacting their plan, um, it's expected at the end of their school year, which their school year is, can be all year long. Um, it can end in May and start in August. It's the flexibility of the families deciding on what's in the best interest of their child. Um, they submit the agreed upon uh, evaluation evidence. I, I review that evidence um, and either return it to the families if they wish or we retain them here um, within our records. Um, it's been great to get to know our homeschool families. I've actually learned quite a bit um, through reviewing their plans and seeing the evidence of the students' work. Um, and um, I hope that our homeschool families do su feel supported because they also are still part of our community, which means that they're still part of you know every student, every classroom, every day. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about homeschool. I, I, do, wanna, I do wanna bring up a couple things. One is, well, I know you've done a really good job with the homeschooling. Um, I, I, my personal experience has been sort of homeschooling um, revolves around groups because the groups of homeschooling parents sort of work together and help each other out. Um, I uh, am aware of a group, uh, especially when I was uh, ran the soccer program in town, and so I got to know a group uh, very well. Uh, they always had good things to say about the relationship with you, but more importantly than that, we really worked hard 
to make sure they understood that there are opportunities for um, homeschooling students uh, that they may not be aware of, like uh, they can play um, sports after school for the middle school and the uh, high school. And the other piece is, for some parents, uh, there are pieces that they don't have the ability to do. Um, for example, I know in the past, from talking to some of the parents, it was language or it was chemistry or physics. And so the school worked really hard to make sure a student could start out taking one course at Middleborough High School in, in physics or uh, language. And what that really revolved around was uh, getting the kids into school and being a part of the school. And for a lot of them, and for the group I particularly knew, uh, most, of their parents, most of the parents sent them to the high school because they got to know it, got to like it, got to enjoy it, had a different perspective of the high school after having been there. Um, and I think the number would have been higher uh, for those numbers that you had had we not uh, sort of tried to reach out to them and say these are opportunities that you can have and i know those parents have spoken to other homeschooling parents and said those opportunities exist and please take advantage of them so i want to thank you for that i think, I think we've seen a, a bit of an uptick in that um, particularly our homeschool students participating in athletics um, taking programming as you said foreign language our lab-based sciences and we have seen some of our homeschool families transition into our school, not only at the high school, we've actually had some families that have transitioned now back into our elementary and into our, our middle school. Um, and, you know, families have been making more requests um, to gain access to resources as is supported by the, the school committee policy for homeschool. Um, and I think it's just been great. Um, I think they're understanding that we, we do feel committed to every child's education and we're here to serve in any way that we can. And hopefully that through our dedicated service and support, they, they recognize that we do provide a high quality experience for all students and that they wish to, to join us full time and, and become a greater part of our Middleborough Public School family. I, I was just curious how, the, um, how a student that is homeschooled um, plays into the, the funding that we get from the state. Um, for for educating students, um, is it the same amount as as in any other? Or if they're not on our October first report, then I do not believe we receive any state funding for them. If they are receiving services, if they are enrolled in a class at the high school, then they are on the October first report. But I would kindly defer to the more expert in the room than myself when it comes to school funding. If Mrs. Hickey feels so inclined to contribute. What you have said is completely accurate. So the October 1st enrollment figures, um, that's where the funding comes. And if a student is homeschooled, they're not enrolled. Dr. Gates, it, it basically goes without saying or is clearly evident that these programs are in good hands with, with Dr. Gates. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation and your ongoing admission, administration. Uh, we now moved on to the budget update and you're gonna re receive your, your first budget update from Ms. Sarah Hickey, so. I apologize if it's not extremely exciting. <laughs> the, uh, I sent an email out to the leadership uh, team last week explaining that starting, uh, well, starting next week, I would only be approving essential spending out of the operational budget. So essentially we can call it a budget freeze. Um, I'm trying to get a handle on where we're at budget wise. And I explained to the leadership team in a meeting yesterday that, <clears throat> that it was similar to trying to measure the level of the water in a bathtub with the drain open. So for the time that I've been here, there's just been money going out, money going out, money going out. And so starting Monday, that's going to slow down dramatically. And I expect, and I'll be able to get a good sense of what's going on financially with the district. And after July 1, uh, we start spending for the following year. And by this time, uh, my, and I shared with the Administrative Council that we should have everything we need for this year, unless it's something that's essential as we move on. So in terms of supply items, uh, technology, books, 
uh, workbooks, anything that we have or need or technology should be purchased at this time already. And then we freeze it, we cut it, and we say, okay, then we can make it have an accounting and really move forward with looking at making sure the budget's balanced moving forward uh, and what we can and cannot spend. So, And that concludes my report, unless there are any questions. Any questions for Mr. about the um, budget at all? It's pretty straightforward. I think this has been done essentially around this time yes. since I've been on the committee. We tend, generally tend to do this to take an assessment. Any uh, thank you, Superintendent. Uh, next item in the agenda is MSBA update. Uh, so we're moving towards the 100% submission. Um, I do want to uh, uh, say a couple things. One, I think all day at, um, at the um, homecoming day on Saturday, I had a few questions. We are not starting digging <laughs> at the high school. That rig was to put wells in the high school. So uh, we were graciously given money from the Pierce trustees uh, to put uh, a new well system in the high school that will be part of the new athletic complex. Um, and uh, that is not, um, been, you know, not a burden on the taxpayer at all, nor does it come out of the, the building money. It was just an addition that the Pierce trustees allowed us and uh, did. And so we're thankful for that. So that is what that digging is. Um, but um, we are moving towards, uh, we are pre-qualifying uh, people. We, the only areas in which we did not receive multiple um, people interested in was elevator and terrazzo. And so elevator and terrazzo are being resent out again uh, to the field there. So people know we are gonna be in that process. And so the hope that we get multiple bidders on those pieces um, and that's not something that um, that's not an unusual occurrence for those two particular pieces. It usually requires a, sort of a little more uh, send out, if you will, to um, let people know and to get them to pre-qualify for the bidding. We establish a pre-qualification committee um, that will be working on that and that pre-qualification committee is our OPM, our uh, project, uh, our architect, um, our director of facilities and uh, Mr. Um, DeRoges, who's sure. the chair of the committee, um, and they will be doing pre-qualifications on contractors and subcontractors uh, to make sure that they meet a certain requirement. We can block uh, people from bidding if we don't think they meet certain requirements, but there's a, essentially a, a system that you have to go through in a review process for each and every one. They're supposed to submit data beforehand that we can take a look at. Um, and if they don't meet those requirements, we can block them from bidding. So, um, the other thing I should say, we had, um, we recently, in yesterday's meeting, which is, uh, should be online, if not today, it should be online tomorrow. Uh, one of the things that we talked about, um, one of the highlights was the conversation about the turf field that we picked. And the, um, we decided to do a shock uh, shock pad, uh, shock pad uh, greatly helps reduce injuries to students. So we are paying extra money for a shock pad, but w we think it's well worth it. Um, and the turf, um, one of the things I think is important because I heard the question, and I know Brian has, um, uh, people came to us and said they had heard sort of that turf fields cause cancer in children, um, and that's not the case. Um, but there is a lot of misinformation out there and we believe that our field expert uh, sort of answered all those questions for us and led and also told people where they could go to find additional information. Uh, and so if people have those concerns, um, I would really recommend watching it. It's, it's very early in the process um, and that they um, uh, can uh, take a look at that themselves if they have. Uh, and the other big thing that we did was we added another um, proprietary piece for security, um, which will be the overall security of the building. Um, and we made that proprietary because it met requirements that we have, requirements that the police and fire have too. And everyone was involved with that decision, the yeah. dirt team, the police, the fire, everyone, which is a good thing. And so proprietary means um, just a particular company can bid it. Uh, and, and Mr. Chair, we also removed uh, <coughs> some items from the regular budget 
and moved them to the top of the alt alternate bid alternate lists uh, so it would give us a little bit more breathing room in terms of the budget because although we are under budget uh, it is about thirty five thousand dollars under uh, the total so we want to create some additional breathing room with the understanding that if there's money uh, at the end of the program those will be returned to the budget uh, and be part of the uh, part of the larger proposal part of the program and some things Project. were taken out of the budget I mean there's been additional things taken out of the budget because we've made uh, decisions uh, people had said to us we should do this and we were like no we're not doing that we think yeah. that's too expensive and we 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 have rationales with every reason uh, but again it's not a question of it's it's a question in our Please mind of how money could be better spent. On behalf of the Nichols faculty and staff, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. It's 825. We've got about five more minutes left in the night, so if you could begin to wrap up your conversations with the teachers uh, so they can go home and get some rest because they can be back bright and early to teach your kids tomorrow. Uh, thanks so much for coming out tonight. Have a safe ride home and a wonderful weekend. With all due respect to Mr. Thomas, that does not apply to school committee members. <laughs> and, and Mr. Chair, yeah. so, so the items that were removed were put into this alternate list that will be added back in once the bids come in, hopefully. And uh, I think the other item that was added to that alt list officially was that the lighting was yeah. potentially, but that's way down the bottom. And uh, potentially for additional insulation, which could increase the R value of the entire building, not required uh, under the, because we're still lead, uh, lead silver yes, yes. Uh, but this could be something that if the money is available and the bids come out right and it's worth it about three more inches of bat insulation yeah so that uh, was that really cool I, I should put in one thing that we found out really yesterday um, that is uh, is again maybe something we need to have a conversation with our legislators um, we are allowed to, we are allowed to get as a school system get discounts um, for various uh, pieces that we buy through what's the program Brian? MHEC mass higher ed Cows, consortium so depending on what, what for example what we buy we get a discount the discount does not apply to contractors building the school so they do not get the same discount um, and so if you will there are pieces that um, and part of the reason is because um, it becomes who's putting them in those type of things so it just gets to be a little messy so you know we've been looking at some things and realizing that why is the price so high and we're realizing now that a part of it is because they can't get that discount that we were like well wait a minute we know you know when we have it we sit down and have a conversation with somebody who presents to us we know it costs this but you're charging a little more and then we're finding out why so it's those type of things that uh, sometimes drive you crazy and so uh, for example one of the pieces that we know about is it's our belief, I'll say it's my belief, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but it's my belief that it would be important to take the varsity baseball field and the varsity softball field and put lighting on them um, so that there's more opportunities. They can play games at night, the community can play games at night, things like that. Unfortunately for us, we're bound by a situation in which we're going to have to pay outside rates to put up lighting. So included in the plans is to make it to make every connection going there that would put up lightings i think there are some of us who believe that we are better off doing it later with involving the community and middleborough gas and electric because we think the price tag will be a lot less than we're being quoted um, but we still want to put it in there so that if there is money available we can take a look at it and see what happens and maybe it's viewed in a different way so those are the things those are things we run into and issues that spring up from time and time again. So, any other questions about that? So, yes, sir. Sorry, I, I heard something earlier about the the track and um, how it might be affected by the the construction schedule. Is is that right? Are we losing the the track for for a time? Yeah. So we lose so um, current track. Current track. Yeah. So we lose we lose current track. Everything out and back at the high school is gone as of winter time. Um, any possibility to, to replace that um, or is it just once the school's done it comes back but there, we're going to be without a track for a couple of years so we'll be borrowing and working with the folks at Aponiquit 
and Carver and Bridgewater State, hopefully, to partner up with them to find practice time and also meet time. Uh, and doing a lot of away meets, unfortunately. Uh, instead of every other meet being home, we might be away more often. Um, the the, the, the multi-use um, field, sports arena field or stadium, for lack of a better word, the, that is, uh, if you look at, if you go to the website and you look at the plans, there is a uh, scheduling where how, how, you know, when these things will be built. That field is getting built, I think, earlier than some of the other stuff. Um, so I don't, are we going to be two, one and a half seasons without a, that field and track? I think it's one and a half seasons. So. I was under the impression there was two full track seasons, but I, I, I could be wrong. Because because of the weather. Well, no, it's also the potential, if you remember, we may open, but the potential exists that we need the, the fire, the fire egress around, and we may not be able to complete the track when it opens. So the, the, the inside of the stadium could still be open, but the track around may have a small piece off that we can allow fire access to. Um, just related to that, and I think it's important to remember, so if you think about this fall season, okay, we have a cross-country team, we have soccer teams, we have field hockey teams, and obviously football practices here. But um, going into next year, they can't practice behind the facilities, so we're gonna have to increase costs to our busing because they're gonna have to go places to either practice or have games. Um, and so I think, you know, this is, this is one of the costs we knew going in that would be an additional cost for us um, because we, you know, we're building behind it. No problem. Uh, next up on the agenda is consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda is, pre is presented. Do I a second? Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. It's approved. Mr. Chair? Yes. I thought we were going to do donkey basketball. Yeah, uh, the superintendent and I have some serious uh, disagreements over that one. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, but I think we may have to just force our will on that. Okay. Um, uh, it may be a liability issue, Mr. Chair. I don't believe there's ever been a liability issue with donkey basketball. Um, it's, a, it's a fun, exciting uh, sport that is just not played in this, these parts enough. Um, Perhaps for the donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up is MASC. Um, uh, Mr. Oakley asked if we could have a conversation about um, the resolutions, and so I believe the resolutions were put in your uh, Dropbox, so thank you. Um, I don't know if, um, I'll go over each resolution and you guys can tell me if you want to discuss them. Um, we had uh, given me the authority to uh, uh, make decisions based on obviously the conversation at the committee, but I, I would obviously like be welcome to your uh, particular input and go from there. The first resolution um, is rejecting the arming of educators. <sighs> Does anyone wish to speak about that? Mr. Catino, do you have any? Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Catino. Um, seeing that, I'm gonna move on. Uh, the second is one that has been really um, a piece that, to be honest with you, I've pushed. Um, one of, uh, part of the resolutions committee is I know two members of the resolution committee really well, Kim Hunt, She's the chairman of the Plymouth School Committee, and uh, Jason Frazier, he's at the Plimpton School Committee. I, I've known them uh, in the past. Um, this is about smaller and rural districts, uh, and to my mind, this really applies to us, which is a lot of times when things come down from the state, uh, the state will address issues that they believe um, really affect cities uh, rather than affect us. So perfect example is um, lunch programs. Um, they had put out uh, the program at the, uh, several years ago that went to cities first, which is about attempting to do free lunch all the time for all students. Um, you know, we know we have schools with over 50% on free and reduced lunch. Um, and in some cases, we are higher than some of the schools in the city. Um, and you can't just put money towards certain areas they have to be open to everybody whom they make sense to be open to and so this resolution is really around the idea of that you know they can't be splits like that they can't be splits just for cities they have to take into account what's going on in communities and rural districts and making sure that they're included and in some cases they're a part of it 
And so um, that's what this resolution is important to. So anyone want to discuss that? Okay. The next one was the elimination of the Federal Department of Education. Um, person running. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I'll give you that. Um, this um, talks about um, there's a, a current idea to merge the Department of Ed with the Department of Labor. Um, and that the message, uh, you know, combining the, uh, to reject the notion of combining the agencies because labor and education are two distinctly different entities and need to be represented, especially on the federal level. Um, resolution number four doesn't really apply to us other than um, it could in this sense, which is it's regional schools transportation. There was, there was I, I agree with what you've, you've got here, but I just was wondering, could that affect us? Could we, could we find a way to maybe lower our cost on those over and above our regular minibus transportations? I mean, could, could we I find, think, uh, like Gatra? Mr. General, this is very specific to regional school trans. So the Bridgewater Rainhams of the world, um, Dighton Rehoboth. Um, so they operate uh, as a separate entity. They have different regulations, budget-wise, and et cetera, too. And they also have I, they, I thought this was for regional transportation authorities, but it is it does say regional school districts. I thought it was more like the use of uh, like GATRA as a transportation provider, but it, it does say regional school districts. And the problem becomes oh. is how they can bid those contracts. Yeah. And so this is a change to allow them to bid the contracts and make them more competitive. Open, open and so yep. I think that makes sense. I mean, the one thing that that could come down is there could be a situation in which <coughs> depending on what's going on you could have multiple school entities at some point bidding contracts together as a group saying you know now instead of just the Middleborough route like Middleborough and Lakeville would join together for a, a bidding contracts so that we could get a better a better bid because you're offering more more opportunity so but that would be a different resolution right no absolutely but I mean like I said it's how how things transpire uh, resolution number five is reporting and accountability standards and what this is saying is outside school entity uh, non-public school entities that take public money uh, in any way shape or form should have to conform to the same standards that we do and so they should have to take MCAS and they should have to take all everything that we're required to take for our students to their students for accountability. Uh, resolution six is on reproductive health uh, for students. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes. I gotta tell you, when I read this one, I, I, I had to almost chuckle a little bit because I went back to my, my days in high school. Um, I went to an all boys Catholic high school and I did take a religion class. Um, in one of my religion class, we discussed this and the best thing that this this teacher had to say was okay this is what the church says but let's be real and uh, we discussed all the items that we're talking about making sure that we have full education in all these subject matters in a public school and i say to myself we did it in a catholic school so if the catholics can do it and we did it we better be doing it in our school to make sure everyone's educated so that's how, how i feel about it personally um and i think a lot of people feel that way and we've also We've also had this discussion previously about the idea. We've even looked at adding health curriculum as part of the phys ed. It just hasn't been able to work it out money-wise yet. Uh, this has been a program that Paul's put forward a couple of times in his budget to try to add to those pieces. And it, you know, obviously this falls into that piece, but um, you know, it has been something that we've looked at and been a part of. And I think, like any of these, it's it's the idea that. Um, you can't make us do this stuff without giving us additional resources to do it. And so I think that's, that's well, I mean, that's always been the MASS, MASC piece in their uh, petition. So any questions about the reproductive health piece? The next up was gender identity inclu inclusive athletic participation policy. Um, so I think, you know, there's been a lot of talk about this. We, we've had constant, conversations about this particular piece for the new high school um, and we're addressing it in how we do with the new high school I will also say that um, I think in some instances in athletics um, athletics offer um, 
the athletic piece has been tough. I mean, not even for uh, gay and lesbian youth, but just for participation of uh, alternate sex in, in, in sports that they, you know, they wanted to. For example, I believe it was last year, Brian, there was a young lady who participated on the boys' golf team, um, did very well for her school, made the MIA tournament, and the MIA refused to allow her to participate because she she couldn't participate in the boys tournament they wanted her to participate in the girls tournament she actually played in the boys tournament and won yep. beat every male golfer outright yep. playing right. from playing from the men's tees uh, and they refused to award her the trophy because it was a men's tournament and the women's tournament is in the fall in the spring excuse me but that was a bone of contention statewide and that has really sort of stirred things up at the MIAA um, with regard to uh, much more vigilance on the part of principals and school superintendents becoming more involved in the process uh, where it was. Uh, so that, that definitely has been addressed and will continue to be addressed. But I also say that athletics has been an area where there's, you know, it moves slowly at times. And we've allowed, we had, we had a young man that played on our, our field hockey team last year and uh, quite successfully. Question about that? Okay. Then uh, resolution eight is sports wagering. So for those who don't know, sports um, wagering uh, became illegal under the Supreme Court. Um, many states. There are currently three states that have full. Uh, no, actually, I take that back. There are eight states that currently have full sports wagering. Uh, right now, um, there are additional states in the loop. I know Massachusetts is looking at it. Um, and so MASC's perspective is if Massachusetts allows sports wagering, uh, then the money derived from there should go to, a piece of it should go to education. And so, and any questions about that? Okay. Um, access for, uh, to information for parents and students who are clients of special education. Now this one was really interesting because I didn't realize this. Um, what they were saying was essentially because of HIPAA laws um, when they do testing, they can't mail the testing home to parents or students. They have to physically give it to them. So I just throw that out there. Um, and I didn't realize that. And so this would allow school districts to send material home to parents and wouldn't require parents to have to come in and get material. The concern that I had with this one was that mailing it out in the preferred language at least five days in advance. I, I just want to make sure it doesn't perf would, would com commit to a, a burden to the, the, uh, the district. Um, no, Mr. Through you, Mr. Chair, that would be a planning piece that would have to be in place for our PPS department. I think it's doable. Um, it, it, it involves costs. It's, it's a mandate, obviously, that if it's approved. Um, but it does, I think it's preferable we provide report cards in their native language we provide MCAS reports in their native language um, we were pride we're required to provide every public report to them in their native language so I have no I have I personally don't and professionally don't have an issue with this um, but it would it would be something that does is would incur some costs um, along the way cool any other questions about that then the final one is proposed to amend the MASC bylaws. Um, the bylaws currently um, state that uh, resolutions need to be in by July 1st. They just want to move it to June 1st, uh, primarily because, uh, to be honest with you, they would prefer to get these booklets out to people over the summertime um, so that there could be, and, and by getting them out over the summertime, they run into a problem this way, which is they, they do do resolution um, sort of uh, workshops for people who want to learn about the resolutions. And so they really have to send this out in September. And so they can't do those resolution workshops until um, really end of September, October. And so the thought that they've had is make, being able to put them out end of June, early July, and actually start that process in August so that you know, some people could go to those over the summertime as opposed to go to them in the middle of school year. So I think that's it. Any other uh, questions? Mr. Oakley. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, this is more of just a comment. Um, I just want to thank the the um, the committee for um, for listening through those. Um, I, I have to admit, I was kind of thrown by some of the titles of those when I first read it. Um, I'm very much in agreement with this, with all of these things, and um, I, I hope that me asking the question allowed some people uh, at home to, to know a little bit more about it. But thank you. Oh, that's great. I, I, that's I, good I, idea. Yeah, I, I don't that's have any. Idea. You know, we don't have. It's something new and different, and we can continue to do that. I, I think that's actually what makes sense and lets people know what we're going to be talking about at our conferences. But also, I think that now the chair really has, you know, we, they, he gets a feel for us, but he now knows how we pretty much feel. And some of us may be on different sides of things, but how we all feel. <laughs> it's a good thing. Um, any other questions about that before I move on? Uh, we're still working on workshop on operation protocols and we will have the policy subcommittee meeting I still need to get through um, Mr. Chair, yes just a point of order uh, at the last meeting did you end up voting to support you and your yes. or or did you want to wait till this was discussed and then no, we, what we did was we voted to, to uh, I was the delegate we had voted to allow me to make decisions at the conference um, and then that came up afterwards Okay. Um, so I really don't think there needs to be a change. No, because uh, what we did, we voted for him to be able to do it, and then we would discuss it, and he'd have our feeling, and it's, he'd be voting. just wanted to make sure that that cool. was so, not something we missed. That's all. That leads right, right into the action item, and I did put into the um, piece about the National School Boards Association Conference uh, for Public Education Leaders March 30th through April 1st. The reason I put this in, uh, just so everyone understands, is our conference really runs uh, Thursday through Saturday, which for a good number of people on our committee makes it impossible for them to go. Um, the 30th through the 1st is a weekend conference. Um, it's the second time in six years it's been on the east coast the last time it was in boston so it was really easy to go to and be a part of um i will say this that i just realized today marks my fifth year on this committee and my 11th year as an elected school committee member um uh by far and away when i went to the boston conference it was it was the best conference i had ever attended in my life and uh, as far as for school committee and it offered great opportunities to have conversations with people around the country and understand issues that they went through were somewhat similar to what we go through and ideas that came up um, and hearing about different pieces and ideas that uh, we were able to bring forward and have conversations with people about. Um, and so I, again, we really spend a lot of time doing, um, doing encouraging people to get professional development for teachers and administrators and, and staff and i think we also have to allow opportunities for us to get professional development so i did want to bring this up we hadn't taken it we would need to take a vote to allow people to do that uh brian asked for the uh bucks. right the inclusions to be in there i put it in i i don't think it's unreasonable i it's i think an 800 dollar if you get by a certain date by january 15th and given other conferences, you know, if you go to professional conferences, that's not an unreasonable amount of money. Um, so uh, I'm open to any questions that people have. I think it's a worthy uh, and again, conference. This is only if people can attend. Right. Mr. Chair, we, we um, as a school committee before, some, some of us were elected, but we as a school committee back in 13, 2013, 2014, um, we were really looking at ourselves to become more efficient, become better school committee members. We did a lot of work uh, back then. And um, when we, requ we don't just require, we require everyone who works for the school district to get professional development, every single person. Um, Jan the, Jan the custodial staff gets professional development. Everyone does, and we ourselves need to do it. And by law, we're supposed to, I think, six hours a year or something like something that, like or, that. Or, or, that, or not, whatnot, and that's by statute. So this is an incredible opportunity to get that um, and bring back and even network with some people from outside of the area. Uh, I'd, I'd love to get, get together with people from Maryland who are very similar makeup, other than they only have 20 school districts or 25 school districts. but. Oh. They do, yeah, by county. But it would be, be an interesting uh, piece to really network with people from outside of our area on certain things. So I think that's a great opportunity. 
um, for whoever gets to attend or can attend. And to put it in perspective, uh, one of the best co uh, workshops I went to, I went, uh, Glenn Kutcher, who's the executive director of MASC, and myself attended a workshop that was run by school board members from Alaska. And it was on the role of the student as part of the school committee and what they did and what they were able to do and they established a conference. So as you know, this is the first year that MASC established a conference for uh, youth school committee members and got them to come, be able to come together and be a part of it. And that came directly from that conference. And um, that, you know, we quite honestly were blown away at what they were able to do and given you can imagine the hurdles they have uh, getting, uh, trying to get students together. So they've actually had to quadrant off the state and do it that way as opposed to one um, in the center of the state. Mr. Chair. Yes. I believe that we approved the, uh, the, the uh, ability for school committee members to attend the NSBA 2019 conference. Do I have a second? Discussion. Anybody else have any comments they wish to make? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. So we'll, I'll send out a note to everybody. If people are interested, let me know and we can figure it out. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes. Under other. Under donations. Can we put that on the agenda for next time? I forgot to mention it at the beginning of the meeting. The uh, item one. That's yes. a, That's That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, if you would, donation. yeah. No, no problem. We, Thank you. Um, I've got to mention it. We just got the information, so we, we will be uh, bringing it up. Um, anybody have anything else they want to bring up? i just like to um, remind people that we're meeting November 15th, uh, which I believe is the third uh, Thursday of the uh, month. Is it not? Yes. Um, so it's a little different than what we said because the second would be during, uh, during the uh, conference. So... Mr. Oakley. Mr. Chair, I just want to apologize in advance. I will not be able to make that. i be celebrating my anniversary um, around that time um, out, of, out of state. But anyway. Congratulations, Mr. Oakley. Congratulations. Um, any further comment? Then the chair will take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Okay. Uh, there's no discussion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much, everybody.